for this? No, one? no. Okay. Half of the day. Sheroes of Resistance to Women Who Fought Back. So uh, we're moving through the course, we're moving through history, we're talking about right now the period of enslavement and resistance to it. Last week we talked about uh, the enslavement uh, primarily in the Caribbean and we talked about the resistance of women that primarily came out of the Akan cultural group, meaning folks that came from what's now Ghana, um, uh, region of Africa. We talked about Nanny of the Maroons. We talked about various rebellions in Burbies and other places. And today's focus will primarily be on the Haitian Revolution, the most important resistance to enslavement during this period, because it's the only one that was completely successful, eliminating enslavement and creating a new country, an independent African nation called Haiti. And that's exactly what it is. And we'll talk about why it's an African nation uh, today. But in addition to that, we're going to also talk about how the reverberations of the Haitian Revolution, the aftermath, led to African women in other parts of the Caribbean and in North America violently resisting enslavement as well. There was a ripple effect in the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution not only led to the independence of Haitians and the end of slavery in Haiti, but also led to the independence of Africans in other parts of the French Empire, as well as parts of the British Empire. When we talk about emancipation in 1834, that's a direct result of the Haitian Revolution. I mean, it's the result of all the rebellions that we've talked about previously in the places like Jamaica and Barbados, which we'll talk about today, and uh, other places. But it was intensified from the success of the Haitian Revolution and the sisters that played a key role in it. None of these revolutions, none of these revolts, whether successful or unsuccessful, would have worked at all without African women. They are key aspects. They're not just tangential to these things. They are key elements to the success of revolutions and rebellions, and Haiti is no, no example. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that today. Um, as always, I'll let everyone know that the course website has been updated, so the recordings of the previous uh, lectures are there. The materials are there. Um, they're constantly being updated. New materials that I'll talk about today are going to be updated uh, and put there as well. So make sure you're utilizing the course website uh, as we move forward. All right, so our evidence today, where are we getting the information for the history that we're talking about? A lot of colonial records, French colonial records, uh, English, American, Spanish colonial records, trial records. When we talk about the Haitian Revolution, there's a number of uh, documents, letters from generals, Leclerc, Dessaline, Toussaint. These were all literate folks that wrote, and there's a ton of correspondence that we have. We have the diaries of people that were imprisoned by the Haitian revolutionaries, white prisoners that wrote diaries about what was happening to them. We have black folks that wrote. We have... Uh, uh, the mulatto class in Haiti. We'll talk about that class. This is the, we'll talk about class stratification in Haiti as well. Um, they wrote, so many people wrote about what happened in the Haitian Revolution. We have tons of documentary evidence. And of course we have oral history, which is just as important. That has come down in Haitian Creole that talks about things that are left out of the written record. And a lot of that oral tradition has more background information about the sisters in the revolution. Because the documentary evidence, a lot of it omits or minimizes the role of African women in the revolution. A lot of those gaps are filled in by the oral history that we still have uh, that has been recorded from the uh, uh, Haitian experience. 
I want to stop here to give us a preview of what's coming up in December and January. Three weeks in December and three weeks in January will be completely devoted to the Haitian Revolution and Haitian, Haitian history. That's what we're doing in December and January. January 1st will mark the 220th anniversary of Haitian independence. And we're going to celebrate that both before and after January 1st. So in December, those three weeks in December, we're going to do a deep dive into the Haitian Revolution because it's incredibly complex and there are a ton of lessons that we can learn from the Haitian Revolution um, to, to apply to 2023. And then in January, we're going to talk about the after effects of the Haitian Revolution. What's going on in Haiti today and how do we get there? What happened after the revolution? What happened in the 19th century, the 20th century, and what's happening in the 21st century? That's what we're going to get into in January. So today's conversation is mostly focused on the sisters in Haiti. But understand, December and January, we're going to have a deeper dive conversation, and it's going to be one of the best seminars that I think we will ever have. Uh, so look forward to that, and the registration link for that will be up soon, so make sure you register for that. All right, as we mentioned last week, we are talking about the slave trade to the West, Africans going to the West, to the Caribbean, to North and South America, and the period that we're going to be talking about today, the late 1700s and into the 1800s, is one of the high points of this period. This is when there's a sugar boom. And right in the middle of this is the most prosperous colony in the Americas. So more prosperous in Canada than the colonies in, in what will become the United States, more prosperous than Jamaica, than Cuba, more prosperous than Guadalupe, Martinique, and these other places. It's Haiti. It's the island of Hispaniola at the time called San Domingue. This is the most prosperous colony in the Americas, called the Pearl of the Antilles. This is what France, this was the crown jewel in France's colonial empire at the time. Why was it so? How did it get to that point? Two crops, one more important than the other, coffee and sugar. Coffee and sugar. These were the primary exports of colonial Haiti. And what made Haiti so valuable to France, it was essentially a death factory a death factory. The reason why it was so profitable, slavery was so profitable and made France so much money is because they created a system of enslavement in Haiti that was essentially hell on earth for Africans. They exploited people to death. Unlike other colonies, particularly let's, if we compare it to what was going on in the 13 colonies of America in the United States, Africans were imported to the Americas. To the U.S., most Africans came to the U.S. from the Caribbean to the U.S. Very few came directly from Africa. Once they came, got into the U.S., particularly as the 19th century went on, as the 1800s went on, the U.S. was concerned more so with breeding Africans. So having a slave population that reproduced itself. So you had Africans that had families and have generations and generations of people that were enslaved. Haiti's the direct opposite. The planters in Haiti imported Africans, worked them to death, and imported more Africans. They weren't necessarily uh, preoccupied with Africans reproducing themselves. They found it more expedient, cheaper, quicker, and more profitable to just keep importing Africans, 40,000 a year at its height. 40,000 Africans coming from the continent into Haiti to be worked to death, lifespan very quick, uh, tortured, and there were always uh, uh, a preponderance of Africans more so than Europeans, so way more Africans than Europeans. In order to maintain that system in the face of having a small minority of whites and this vast majority of Africans, the brutality was to an extreme. In order to control those Africans, the brutality was to the extreme. The social stratification that was created in Haiti made it so that you had a group of free Africans that had a sense of entitlement over the masses that were being uh, imported into Africa, you uh, imported into Haiti. You had a class, the mulatto class. So white men have, having black uh, uh, sex slaves produced a mulatto class of children. They were given a, a more privilege over the rest of them. Of course, they would never be equal to whites. And there were also two classes of whites. There were the grand, the grand whites, the big whites, the big planters that owned all the money. Then there were poor whites in Haiti. Even that class had more rights than the mulattoes, and the mulattoes had more rights over the free Africans, and everybody had more rights over the 
masses of Haiti, the enslaved Africans that most of whom came directly from the continent. Something like 65 to 70 percent of the Africans present in Haiti had come directly from the continent. So when we get to 1791, at the outbreak of the Haitian Revolution, over two-thirds of the Africans in Haiti weren't born in Haiti. They were born free on the continent. Prisoners of war brought to Haiti. That's a really important demographic point when we talk about the Haitian Revolution. Two-thirds of the Africans that participated in it were born in Africa. So this is what the Africans were brought to in Haiti, a, a system of brutality that was unequal throughout the rest of the Americas. Work you to death, import more Africans. So if you're coming into a system like that, the only option that you have is to fight. There is no other option. There is no other alternative because they're planning on working you to death. So you can either go to death sheepishly and just work and die, or you can fight. And again, most of these Africans came out of a context of war back home anyway. They were captured in war, or they were war prisoners. So fighting is not, not, was not unknown to them. So this is the circumstance, this is the context that we're dealing with when we talk about Haiti. One of the key areas where Africans from, uh, uh, where Africans came from that ended up in Haiti. They came from all over the continent. They came from the Senegambia. They came from Guinea. In fact, the Haitian word for African is actually Guinea. Guinea. Uh, that became a, the classifier of African. So you got Africans from Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, guinea Conakry, what's now Guinea-Bissau, guinea Conakry. You got Africans from the Congo, like we talked about, Angola, uh, the Congo Kingdom. You got Africans that are coming from Southwest, what's now Southwest Nigeria. And you also have Africans that are coming from what's now the Republic of Benin, then known as the Kingdom of Dahomey. And this is really important because all of these Africans are going to bring their spiritual traditions, their political traditions, their intellectual traditions, and their martial traditions, their war traditions with them to Haiti. And they're going to have to figure out how do we create, at first, maroon communities, quilombos, mukambos, these uh, escaped Africans that were formed these communities in the, in the hills and in the, uh, uh, in the woods. And then, once the revolution, how do we create a united army, a united guerrilla army to fight against the French and the Spanish and the British? And then afterwards, how do we create a new nation from all the nations that we represent, as well as the Creoles, the ones that were born there, as well as the mulatto class, as well as the free blacks and all this? How do you make a new nation with all these moving parts? We're going to get more into that in December, but the sisters play a key role in that. But, one, but I want to talk about one of these nations in particular because it kind of gives us a nice uh, entree into the role of sisters as warriors during the Haitian Revolution, and that's the Kingdom of Dahomey. One of the key, excuse me, what is this? All right, I got to turn this off. It's making too much noise. Um, and I apologize for that. One of the key kingdoms in Africa at the time, a growing kingdom in Africa when the sugar boom is just about to happen in the uh, 18th century, and that's the kingdom of Dahomey. And what's right now the Republic of Benin, between the 1700s and the 1800s, this kingdom expands from north to south. And these wars between Dahomey and the kingdom of Alada, these provided a number of the captives that would go to either the Portuguese or the Dutch, and then eventually end up in French hands and end up enslaved in Haiti. So again, state building is nothing new to Africa. It's nothing new to the world. At the same time in Europe, you got all types of wars going on between the Spanish, between the French, the English and the French, all the Dutch and the French. All these types of wars are going on. The difference being the state building that's happening in Europe and the state building that's happening in Asia among different kingdoms is not resulting in the prisoners of war being taken somewhere else. So don't think that uh, African state building is what led to the slave trade. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the Europeans are there on the coast wanting prisoners, wanting captives, wanting labor to the, for the Americas. And as the state building is happening in Africa, as empires are growing and collapsing and kingdoms are growing and fighting on the kingdoms, there's this new outlet for prisoners. So as this kingdom expands, the kingdom of Dahomey expands over uh, the century, Many of those wars produce the captives that are coming to Haiti. And what is the cultural and political context that they're coming out of? They're coming out of a place where women are playing a key role in this state building process. 
one, in the position of queen mother. We talked about queen mothers in uh, the, the Ashanti kingdom. We talked about king, queen mothers and, and uh, female rulers in the kingdom of Congo, and the kingdom of Ndongo. We talked about Queen Njinga. We see the same thing here. Again, many of these African kingdoms, you have a king, you have a queen mother. You have female rulers, female political leaders, female military leaders, all emerging at this time. At the same time, another reason why this kingdom is expanding uh, during this period, they do something novel in that they create all female fighting forces. The special forces of the kingdom of Dahomey were forces comprised of all women, young women that were trained in martial arts, in, in, in martial, the science of, of making war, and they become known as the Minon, the Minon. And later on, when we get to the 19th century, when the French come to colonize uh, the, the Kingdom of Dahomey, it's these sisters that put up the fiercest resistance. A movie was made about them last year. It was last year or two years ago? Time is escaping. I think it was last year. The Woman King. The Woman King is about these sisters. Uh, the European historians and anthropologists that studied Kingdom of Dahomey, they called them the Amazons of Dahomey because that is the only thing that the Europeans could think of was these mythical Amazons from Greek mythology women fighters that you know were, were highly skilled so they put that title on these sisters but that's not what they called themselves they were known as the Minon or our mothers because these were the sisters that defended the kingdom and defended the king and they were these special forces uh, of the, the kingdom of Dahomey so think about this Africans that are coming out of this area of the continent where these wars are happening and they recognize okay in political systems what do we need we need a powerful queen mother, got to have a queen mother. And in addition to that, we also know that women are capable, and in the case of Dahomey, the most capable of waging war. So when they get to Haiti and they become Maroons, when they escape plantations to form Maroon communities, or when the revolution sparks off in 1791, again, right in the middle of the kingdom of Dahomey's expansion in this portion of West Africa, they're bringing these same ideas. So it's not unheard of to give a woman a gun, and give a woman a machete, to give a woman anything that she could use to fight for freedom. Because it's the same thing that they have been doing back home. So that's very key uh, to understand how that cultural thread continues across the Atlantic. Very important to point out. And in fact, one of the key heroines of the Haitian Revolution comes from this cultural context. And we'll talk about her uh, in a second. So let's Again, uh, just zoom in so we can look at what, what we're talking about geographically. As you can see, the island of Hispaniola is divided between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The Spanish control the eastern side of the island, the French the western portion. Uh, and Haiti is what we're going to be talking about. We'll also talk about the effects on the Dominican. Uh, uh, not today. We'll talk about that in December. First person, first sister I want to discuss is Cecile Fatima. The Haitian Revolution lasted for 13 years, and it starts in August 1791. And it starts at the Bois Cayman ceremony, one of the most important events in African world history. Because it's at this ceremony that it's decided that the revolution is going to begin. Now, this is not the first time Africans had revolted in Haiti. We go all the way back to 1521 on the Dominican side of the island, but Africans had been revolting on this island since the days of Columbus' son. Africans had been revolting. They continued to revolt. They would run away into the mountains, that, the, that mountain range that separates, right now separates the, uh, Haiti from the Dominican. That uh, was a key area for Maroonage. So there had always been revolutions and attempted revolts. Uh, probably before 1791, the most famous had been the revolt of uh, Mackendal. Mackendal's revolt, where he was going to poison all the whales and kill all the whites and all this. And when Mackendal was going to be executed, he vowed he was going to return. And many people think he returned, his spirit returned in the general Jean-Jacques Dessalines. We'll talk about him in a second. But even in Mackendal's revolt, sisters played a key role as organizers, as folks that were going to handle the poison and do all these things. Sisters played a key role in that. So when we get to Bois, the Bois Cayman ceremony, you have two officiants. This is a political ceremony, it's a military ceremony, and it's a spiritual ceremony all wrapped up in one. One of the officiants is a man named Bukmon Doti. Bukmon, uh, we know, came from Africa, probably from Guinea, 
There's some reports that he might have been a Muslim, but he was one of the practitioners. He was one of the officiants of this ceremony. The other was a voodoo mambo named Cecil Fatima. A mambo is the spiritual leader of a voodoo community and someone that communicates with the ancestors and with the spirits. So what's happening in Haiti at this time is also a combination of those different spiritual systems that are coming from the continent. So again, you got Africans that are coming from Angola, that are coming from Congo region, Africans that are coming from Guinea, Africans that are coming from Dahomey, Africans that are coming from uh, Europe controlled areas. And they all have their own understandings of the spiritual world and how that spiritual world interacts with our material world. These Africans are blending these understandings and creating a tradition that has as its base a fawn, uh, F-O-N, fawn, uh, spiritual system that's coming out of Dahomey, but also incorporates what's happening in Angola, what's happening in Congo, what's happening in Guinea. So you have this pantheon of spirits all underneath one God, but these pantheon of spirits that represent these different African nations and different energies that are, you know, exist among human beings. Energies for war, energies for love, energies for revenge, energies for cooperation. All of these things are represented by these different loas. And we and, and voodoo are called loas, these different spiritual entities that represent these different ideas that can be uh, uh, connected to people and personages. And people can be possessed by these energies. So Cecile Fatimon is a spiritual leader who's there and she is the one that sacrifices the pig to start this ceremony, to get the ceremony going. And that sacrifice is very important. In African religions, making sacrifice of animals is, is a key element of uh, bringing spiritual power into the material world. So this is what happens. Um, and we don't know if this happened on uh, August 14th or August 21st, 1791, but it's one of those times. And the Africans pledged at this meeting that they were going to end slavery. They were, they were going to fight, and that they wouldn't be taken prisoner. They're going to fight to the death because you're already dying. If you're enslaved in Haiti, you're just you're already dying. So you might as well go out fighting, and that's exactly what they did. And uh, there's a famous. Uh, this comes out of the oral tradition and is even written in histories. This is apparently what Bukman said during the ceremony. He said, "The good Lord who created the sun, which gives us light from above, who rouses the sea and makes the thunder roar, listen well." All of you, this God hidden in the clouds watches us. He sees all that the white man does. The God of the white man calls him to commit crimes. Our God asks only good works for us. But this God who is so good orders revenge. He will direct our hands. He will aid us. Throw away the image of the God of the whites who thirst for your tears and listen to the voice of liberty which speaks in the hearts of all of us. This was put in the mouth of, of Bukma. So after this, the Africans revolted. Plantations were set on fire. Brothers and sisters, men and women, attacked the plantation owners. They destroyed the implements of, of, of the sugar refineries and all the, This was a total revolution. When this happened, we get about three years afterwards, uh, 1793, 1794. And the destruction is so much that slavery is ended in Haiti by the time we get to 1793. It's, it's done. Not independence. Slavery, though. It's still a French colony. But the French are so beat up that, so, that slavery is over. By the time we get to 1794, uh, the, the slavery has to be abolished. The planters can't sustain it anymore. So that phase of the struggle is a victory. The Africans uh, obliterated slavery. But then a new leader comes in, in France, Napoleon. Napoleon is fighting a whole bunch of wars in Europe. He's seeing the production out of, 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 of Haiti is not sustaining the things he wants to do. He wants to reinstitute slavery in Haiti. By reintroducing slavery in Haiti, the next phase of the struggle begins. And the stage now is to make sure that Napoleon's and his, his general Leclerc aren't able to reinstitute slavery. And then ultimately that struggle transforms into one of independence. Because at this time, the leadership has changed. And we're going to get into this in, 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 in December. But the leadership has changed. The first leaders of the revolution, people like Cecile Fatimon, uh, uh, John uh, uh, Francois, uh, 
George Bissau, these are some of the early leaders of the Haitian Revolution, have changed to other folks that have joined later, people like Toussaint Leoberto, who joined later, who was a free African at the time that the revolution started. So you have this change, but now the fight takes a different dynamic when Leclerc enters the picture and others enter the picture. And again, sisters are fighting this whole time. You got sisters like uh, uh, Suzanne Belair, who was married to Charles Belair, one of the lieutenants in the army. She actually becomes, gets to the rank of lieutenant herself. And she's fighting against this invading French army. And in fact, the oral tradition has this. She's actually captured with her husband, Charles Belair. And we'll talk about the circumstances of his capture in December. But they're captured, um, and they're going to be put to death by the French. As they're being led to execution, two things happen. One, her husband starts crying. And apparently, according to oral tradition, she actually slaps her husband and says, what are you crying for? It is a joy to die for liberty, to die for freedom. Like, what are you crying for? The second thing is, the French wanted to uh, use the guillotine on her. Uh, she said, and her husband was going to be shot by firing squad. She said, no, I want to die like my husband. And she was honored in that request. So they didn't bid her. And her husband was shot in front of her by firing squad. And then when she stepped up, they said she had no fear. And she didn't even put a blindfold on. She wanted the people to see that she wasn't afraid of death. And she was put down by the firing squad. But this is all after an amazing career that saw her rise to the rank of lieutenant. And that's her on, the, on a bank note in Haiti. Uh, I think this came out in the, the past 20 years, this, this $10 bank note with her, with her image on it. So you had sisters like her. You had, uh, during this war, sisters had to fight. There was no getting around it because when Leclerc comes to, to Haiti, the fighting gets so intense that he comes to this conclusion. He says, we must destroy all the Negroes in the mountains, men and women, keeping only infants less than 12 years old. We must also destroy half of those in the plain. Without this, the colony will never be quiet. This is 1802. This went from a war to reimpose slavery to now essentially Leclerc calling for genocide. So the Africans knew, all right, all bets are off. We got to fight. And when we talk in December about the Haitian Revolution, this was one of the most violent events in world history because this was a fight, again, against extermination. So sisters have been fighting this whole time, but now they're definitely engaged in the struggle because they have no choice to be. They, there's no choice to let the men fight Sam. At this point, 1802, the Haitian Revolution had been going on for 11 years. A lot of the men had been killed. So by the time we get to Haitian independence in 1803, the vast majority of the population are women. Are women because of the, what the fighting had done to the, the male population. So the people that get the keys to this new independence of Haiti, the leadership may be men, but a lot of the heavy lifting was done by sisters. Very important thing for us to point out. So you got sisters like Grand Toya, also, AKA also known as Victor, uh, Victoria Armantu, who was in tradition an aunt to General Dessalines and also one of the fighters in his troops. Um, she is reported to have come from the kingdom of Dahomey, again, with that tradition of very strong, very uh, 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 highly trained, female warriors. In some traditions, she even trained Dessalines when he was a child. So very important figure. We wouldn't have the ferocious first independent leader of Haiti, Dessalines, without Grand Toya. One of the French writes this, this small number of rebels under the command of Toya, so she commanded her own forces, was quickly surrounded and taken prisoner by the regiment. During the struggle, Toya runs away, pursued by two soldiers. A melee took place between them and Toya. One of them was seriously injured by Toya, and the other, helped by a few other soldiers who arrived in time, took Toya as a prisoner. So this short passage tells us a lot. <laughs> that this sister, one, commanded her own troops. She commanded her own troops. She was under the command of Dessalines, but she had her own troops that followed her. In the process of fighting the Finch, her troops are surrounded, and then she makes a break for it. And then when they send two grown men after her to fight, two grown men, one of them is seriously injured. So just she runs away, two grown men go after her, one of them gets seriously injured. She takes him down, <laughs> uses some type of martial arts or whatever she is she doing, she takes him down. And it took reinforcements for the other guy to even capture her, and they still capture her alive. She's able to break out of prison, 
and continues fighting. She's one of the people that survives into Haitian independence. Grand Toya, very important figure. Not a lot written about her because, again, in the European historiography and even in later Haitian historiography, the role of sisters is not given as much attention. But without this woman, who knows where Dessaline would be? I mean, who knows what the Haitian Revolution would be? Very important figure that we, we have to uh, uh, talk about. We got to talk about Marie Jean, another one of the fighters who was a great sharpshooter, uh, who was able to hold off French troops that were uh, coming uh, against a, uh, uh, a fort that her and her forces um, controlled. Again, was put on a stamp in, in the 20th century to show uh, her uh, uh, courageous fighting. So very important. And then there's all the unnamed women whose names are lost to the written history, but who are remembered in their families, remembered in Haitian oral tradition, that made this revolution successful through the feeding of troops. Wars aren't won with guns alone, particularly when you're fighting a war where a large portion of it is guerrilla warfare. The, the, the Haitians were never as armed as uh, uh, heavily as the French that were coming in. Because when Napoleon sent Leclerc, he, didn't, he sent tens of thousands of troops to Haiti. He was, he was trying to really recapture Haiti. Because again, he needed the money for his wars of conquest in Europe. So he needed Haiti. So he sent tens of thousands of troops to Haiti. Many of those troops never saw France again. They died from uh, fever and they died from the Haitians <laughs> killing them. But this is what Leclerc wanted to do. And they were heavily armed. Now, the Haitians, for their part, were able to get arms you know, from the French that they captured and killed. They were also able to put the Spanish against the French and the French against the British and get arms that way, um, playing off of European tribalism. Because again, Africans are really smart at doing this, very strategic. So playing off European tribalism, they were able to get, get guns and things like that. But for the most part, they're fighting a guerrilla war, meaning they have to use the terrain. They have to use the land. They have to rely on the things that are around them. And one of Toussaint's actually strategies was, we're going to destroy farms and plantations. That way, when the enemy comes, there will be no supplies and food for the enemy. But when you do that, what do you do? You have to retreat back into the wooded areas, back into the inaccessible areas, and somebody has to grow food for your army to eat. Because if you destroy the food, <laughs> who's, you? so this is one of the things that sisters did. Sisters grew the food. They supplied the army, the forces, with food, um, feeding the troops. Espionage. A lot of the fighting didn't just take place in the countryside. You had urban fighting, and you had communication that was key to any successful revolution is, is the control of communication and to get information from your enemy. So you had these French troops and French officials and, and, and even the folks that had betrayed the Haitian Revolution that sided with the French in these major cities. And in those cities, you had women that worked as in the market, which many women still do in Haiti and other places in Africa today. They run the markets, so they're able to hear things, observe things, see troop movement, be able to identify how many troops are going here, what's going on, these things, and get that information out to the rebel leaders that were fighting. You had sisters that worked as prostitutes. I mean, there's no clean way to say that. They worked as prostitutes. And just like what uh, women did uh, in the Vietnam War, these sisters that worked as sex workers were able to get information and get that out to the rebel leaders. So espionage was a key element of the role that sisters played in the Haitian Revolution. Because even at, when all this was going on, you still had French officials and, and generals and other folks that still relied on slave labor in their homes and things like that. So you got sisters and even free Africans that sold their labor uh, to the French that are giving information to the rebel leaders. They're working in these homes. They're hearing things. They're the women that handle laundry. They're the women that do all these things. They're able to get communication to the rebel leaders and help make the transition to independence possible. Medical care. These sisters came from Africa with a knowledge of, 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 of plant medicines and different things. So when troops were hurt, it's not like they're going to hospitals. It's the sisters that are care carrying their wounds. It's the sisters that are providing uh, medical assistance when disease strikes. You know, so one of the main reasons that uh, Haiti was able to get independence was the pandemics that affected the French soldiers, that they weren't used to malaria, yellow fevers, all these types of things. Africans were able to sustain themselves because they had the medical know-how 
uh, against a lot of these tropical diseases because these are some of the same things that you encounter back home in Africa. So African women were able to use that knowledge of medicine and science to help maintain the revolutionary armies. Spiritual resistance, just like at the beginning of the revolution with Cecil Fatima, we cannot underplay the role of spirituality in the Haitian revolution. It's key. If you were going to ask the revolutionaries who some of their allies were, one of the first things that you will get is we were allied by the spiritual world, the Loas. The Loas were our allies. It's not an abstract understanding to these folks that are fighting this revolution. For them, they are fighting hand in hand with their ancestors. They're fighting hand in hand with these spirits that want justice, that want revenge for all the atrocities that were meted out against Africans. That was not abstract. That was not just wishful thinking. The, the, the ceremonies, the sacrifices, the communication with the spiritual world, a lot of that facilitated by women. This was a key element of the Haitian Revolution that cannot be understated. And sisters played a key role in that, going all the way back to Cecile Fatima. So this, all of these forces, all of this work by, done by these sisters ultimately leads in January 1st, 1804, to independence. And when this independence happens, it reverberates all through the Caribbean, all through North America. Because one of the things that happens, actually going all the way back to 1791, when the revolution is occurring, a lot of Martin French, they get their enslaved Africans and they leave immediately. 1791, 1792, 1793. Once they see the writing on the wall, they leave. They go to Louisiana. They go to Guadeloupe and Martinique. And they go to Jamaica. And they go to Cuba. They get out. And they take their enslaved Africans with them. But these enslaved Africans know, OK, we're not leaving just for no reason. They, they, they knew about things going on in the island way before the whites. This is one of the key elements of enslaved communities throughout the Americas. The networks of communication were always faster among the enslaved than it was among the whites. But when they're forced to leave, and this rumor of the Haitian Revolution starts to go, because the whites tried to suppress it. They didn't want this knowledge going to Jamaica, going to Cuba, going to Barbados, going to North America, that these Africans have revolted and they're actually being successful. And by 1794, slavery is actually abolished in the French colonies. They don't want this information going out to Africans. But as these Africans are, are migrated from Haiti to these other places, they bring this story with them. And then they bring this thirst for their own freedom with them. So we're going to talk about the revolutions that occur both from Africans that have left Haiti, that go to different places, and also Africans in these other places in the Americas that hear about Haiti in the early 19th century. We'll talk about that when we uh, come back from break. So we'll stop here for a second. We'll open up to any questions uh, or comments, and then we'll get back into it. Um, Daniel, anything in the chat? There is nothing in the chat, but Mr. Thomas, go ahead. Morning, Rob. It behooved me to understand this rich history of the in Jamaica. And all Haiti was known for back then, from my understanding, is voodoo. Mm -hmm. Yet, we were at the time struggling for our own independence and self-government. And yet, none of this rich history came out. It behooves me. Yeah, it's not, I'm, not, I'm not surprised by that, because there was a sustained effort after, during the Haitian Revolution and after uh, to not tell other African people about it. And then as the years went on, Haiti only comes into mind when the uh, uh, first the French, but then later the Americans want to present Haiti as a failed state, as backwards, all this and all that. So among African people, the people that know, these heroes were given high esteem. But among other folks that wanted to live off exploitation, that wanted to live off of the, the, the resources of African people, th this example of Haiti, what Haiti did to get free, was suppressed, heavily suppressed. And it's still being suppressed. This is why I'm going to have the seminar in December, because a lot of people don't understand this. And they don't really get how valuable Haiti is to African people. Because if, you under if we understood that, if African people understood how valuable Haiti was, we wouldn't let what happen, what's happening in Haiti happen. And when I say what's happening, I'm not talking about just recently, but what's been happening since the early 20th century. The 
continued invasions, the continued sponsored coups, all of these things that destabilize this place that we should value. We should value Haiti the same way people internationally value the settler state of Israel. This is how much we should value Haiti. We should value Haiti with that regard because it is that important to African people. And I hope with this short lecture, as well as what we're going to do in December and January, that people start to understand that because uh, it's really, it's that important. Um, and again, you're right, a lot of this stuff has been uh, uh, suppressed. Um, let me go to uh, David H. And, and then Robert. Uh, thank you. I'll do that better. So if I'm understanding correctly, Haiti is the framework or the example that many people could use as the model to get to get together and infiltrate, uh, set up resistance, because it's already been done and done successfully. And the Europeans uh, don't necessarily want that example out there and therefore are continuing to, to crush Haiti and make sure it stays destabilized because it was a successful example of unity. Yes and no. Yes and no. And the reason why I say yes and no, um, in a general sense, yes, you're correct. Um, the, the symbol of Haiti and what was done in Haiti and, and the unity that it took to get that independence um, is an example and has was suppressed because of the example. But know in that what we're going to do, we're not going to study the Haitian Revolution and Haitian independence uncritically because there were things that were mistakes um, that occurred right after independence and, and even into the 19th century that we're going to analyze. So we're not saying it's a perfect model. It's so far from being perfect. But the things that did work, we need to study intently. What made that unity functional among these different groups and how were they able to use that? What we're going to study also is the mistakes that were made. What happens when independence is achieved? That's when the real work begins because now you're in the process of creating a new society. How are you going to do that? What ideas are going to be uh, used to model that society? Who's going to be put in charge of that society? And what happens with the decisions that they make. So we're going to look at it as a model, not to say that everything that was done was done right and done perfect, but to say, how can we look at the situation and see we, how can we advance the positive aspects and not repeat the negative aspects? We have to look at it as a case study in that regard. And that whole process of actually engaging the Haitian Revolution and in many other parts of African history to do those things, that's one of the things that we've been lacking as, as, a, as a collective people, quite honestly, African people, is looking self-critically and objectively at our history. One, we don't look at our history at all, but when we do, we fall into one or two traps. Either we look at all the negatives and say, well, here's the bad things that happened. We can't possibly ever learn anything from this or progress, so maybe from what not even, we shouldn't even look at it. Or we look at it with two... Uh, rose-colored glasses where they say, oh, this is all the good things happen. It's the glorious African past. No, you can't do either one. You have to look at it objectively and self-critically and to see what we can take and what we can use and what we have to uh, refrain from doing. So that's what we're actually going to do in December and January. So, uh, yeah, that, if that's the long way of saying <laughs> that's the answer to that. Um, let me give David H. to follow up and then we'll go, go to Rob. Go ahead. Oh, that's just, a, that's just a thumbs up. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I, I got to put my glasses on. All right, Robert, go ahead. All right. Um, so a comment and then a question. The comment is the, we certainly have seen that the, the oppressors learned that, oh, wait a second, we can't just like work people to death. We got to create a system uh, where we give a little bit, make people comfortable like we are here in Canada and North America. Uh, do nothing that will fundamentally change the system because give everyone a little enough so that they're happy enough that they're not going to do anything to your ad. So, And the question is, um, did the Africans who were giving their war captive to the Europeans, did they know about the brutality of Haiti that the folks were heading to? That's a good question. I don't have the answer to that 100%, to be honest. But 
Um, quite frankly, I don't even think they cared. Um, and here's why, because the folks that were in the leadership of these nations that were growing, their main concern was creating empire and creating nation uh, and creating nations for their own selfishness. I don't have any love for many of these kings and queens and empire buildings because to build an empire is inherently violent. There, there are very few examples in world history, let alone African history, of voluntary, I want to join an empire. So that mere process is violent. And it's not even indicative of all the peoples in Africa, because you got so many peoples throughout the continent that were against joining empires, and they resisted empires. People like the Balanta in Guinea-Bissau, people like the Oromo in Ethiopia and, other, and, and in Kenya. So you have these examples of more horizontal, more uh, socially equitable societies in Africa that didn't want to be a part of these hierarchical or pyramidal structures. Uh, so when these folks went about the process of building that, and then some of them, and it, it's, some of it is cycl cyclical in that some of these nations were built in response to enslavement. Is all right, we need to build a massive army so that way we don't become a part of the victims of this slave trade. So it becomes this vicious cycle of, all right, in order to avoid getting caught up, we're going to build an army to protect ourselves and go on the offensive and then enslave other people so that we don't get enslaved. But then ultimately what that does is weaken the entire continent for colonialism. Uh, so it's, I don't, I don't know if they knew, is, is the answer to that historically. I don't know if they knew, and Daniel might be able to help me out with this if he, if he has more understanding than I do. I don't know if they knew, but part of me feels like I don't even know if some of these leaders would care, or if so-called leaders, I call them warlords. I don't even know if these warlords would care uh, because these are the same folks that we're seeing. These are the descendants of folks that we see today that are running Africa, and they're not doing it in the best interest of the African working masses, doing the interest of their own pockets. And it's the same class that was back then. Um, Daniel, do you, have, do you got any, any uh, insight on this? Because I, I can't think of anything. Um, could, um, could you explain the question? Yeah. Uh, do, do you, uh, what Rob is asking is, do we think that African leaders that sold their captives to Europeans knew what they were sending them to. In, in Haiti, in particular. In Haiti, yeah, in, in particular to Haiti. No, I, I do not think that they had a way of doing that. I think that is underscored by uh, formerly enslaved Eden from um, Nigeria named Olada Equiano, who mm. wrote a biography where he talked about how drastically different the conditions of enslavement were in the Americas versus in West Africa. And I think the fact that we have an ancestor who grew up in a rural environment and was able to note the difference, I think that highlights right there that our ancestors didn't have a way of knowing how severe conditions over here actually would be. And then, like, nobody went very few people went back that experience, especially to Haiti. You weren't going back to Africa. I don't know if there's any of Africans from Brazil that were able to, particularly in the 19th century, that were captured in Africa, enslaved in Brazil, and then able to go back to Africa and could have possibly said, all right, this is what's going on and where we were. But if you were transported to Haiti, you weren't coming back. So the chances of, of hearing what was going on, you probably weren't going to uh, get that information. I, that's, that's probably the best way to talk. But the folks in this region did know what was going on. And many of them, again, they, they came from Haiti to these places. Because what happened after the Haitian Revolution, and particularly after Haitian independence, there's now a vacuum in sugar production and coffee production, but primarily sugar. So now the British are looking at this and saying, well, here's our opportunity to take control of the sugar market in Europe.
because the French had dominated it because they had this death factory called Haiti, or Saint-Domingue, and that was putting out all the sugar. So now with that out of the way, Cuba wants to step up, and this is controlled by the Spanish. The Jamaica wants to step up, which is controlled by the, the English. Barbados wants to step up. And even the nascent United States to step up its sugar production to make up for the money that uh, this new you know, hole in the market that the lack of production coming out of, uh, out of Haiti is producing. So in order to do that, they need to import more Africans from the continent themselves. And they need to make the, because sugar production is incredibly labor intensive. So in order to get people to do that, you need to step up your brutality as well. Coffee, you can kind of grow coffee and kind of walk away, and it doesn't take that much. So that's not as labor intensive as sugar or something like cotton, but sugar is. So in Jamaica, in Cuba, in Barbados, in Louisiana, and other places, you start to see more repression. You start to see more Africans being imported. And in addition, the repression also kicks up because they don't want a repeat of the Haitian Revolution. So all types of new laws, all types of new things are being done to limit the uh, exposure to the Haitian Revolution and for any Africans to get any ideas. But the problem is, this kind of backfired. Because if you increase repression, you also increase resistance. It's like what, 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 what you said, Robin. Even, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, Africans during enslavement, although the Europeans thought of them as property and as animals, basically, that could be anything that could be done with them, the Africans never thought of themselves as property. Africans never thought of themselves as animals. So although they're enslaved, they expect a particular type of treatment. Even if it's, it's it completely inhumane in terms of our standards and everything else, Africans expect it. All right, if you say we got to work six days a week and you're going to give us this amount of food and this is what's going to happen, we expect that. So the minute that you start to say we're up in the work, we're lessening the food, we're doing these things, then Africans say, all right, well, we've been putting up with this up to this point and, and trying to survive and raise families and do these things. Now we don't have no choice but to revolt. So even in those conditions, Africans re expected a certain amount of treatment. So this is going to blow up uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, and it's going to lead to independence. Every year, we have Emancipation Day. And the way it's presented sometimes is as if the British, through their uh, uh, abolitionists and others, just decided one day that, you know, slavery is wrong, let's end it in our colonies. No, they saw what happened in Haiti, and then they saw these revolts that we're going to mention in Jamaica, in Barbados, and these other places. And the British were the first to say, all right, we need to go ahead and end this. It, it's only when Africans revolt and do the, that all of a sudden we need to end it and figure out another way to exploit African labor. So a couple of books that I'm going to mention uh, that kind of you can read, uh, some of them are new, some of them are old, uh, that talk about some of the things that we'll mention. Uh, Hilary Beckles, one of the great scholars of uh, history of the enslaved in the Caribbean, um, I think he's Sir Hilary Beckles now, um, has a book called Centering Women, Gender Discourses in Caribbean Slave Society, which talks a lot uh, about this. We have Island on Fire, The Revolt That Ended Slavery in the British Empire by Tom uh, uh, Zollner, uh, which deals with the Christmas Rebellion in Jamaica, also known as Sam Sharp's Rebellion uh, in 1831 in Jamaica. And also American Uprising, The Untold Story of America's Largest Slave Revolt by Daniel uh, Robinson. Now, this one, the Robinson book is... Uh, it's one of those history books that's definitely geared toward more general audience. So it's one of those books that you could find like in an airport or something like that. So it's a relatively easy read. But it deals with a revolt that happened in the US that most people aren't even familiar with. And most people might know Nat Turner. They might know Gabriel Prosser and Denmark Vesey. But the largest actual slave revolt happened in Louisiana in 1811. And it's a direct result of Africans that were enslaved in Haiti that were transported to Louisiana. Uh, who uh, lead, lead this result. One person who I want to bring up. So this happened in Barbados in 1816. Um, one of the most, it's also in, in history, it's called Bussa's Rebellion. B-U-S-S-A, Bussa's Rebellion. But 
That's a name given later on by historians. But this rebellion that occurred in Barbados, which no one thought would actually happen, because Barbados was an English uh, 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 colony. They had the reputation of, well, we treat our Africans relatively well. Why would they ever revolt? And of course, they did in 1816. And one in particular, one of the leaders of the revolt, who we know very little about, but we know must have played a key role, was a woman named Nanny Grigg. Nanny Grigg comes, we know about Nanny Grigg from the testimony of one of the Africans that participated in the revolt, but eventually uh, uh, turned yeah. informant and snitch. So Nanny Grigg. Nanny Grigg was enslaved on the Simmons plantation in, in, in Barbados. And Nanny Grigg apparently heard about the Haitian Revolution. And in the process of organizing people for the, the planned rebellion in Barbados, she was said this, the only way to obtain freedom was to fight for it. And she based this off her understanding of the Haitian Revolution. She said, we got to be like the Haitians. We got to burn this thing down. We have to fight for it. This is the only way that we can do that. So she was one of the kids. We don't know what happened to her. We don't know if she was killed during fighting. We don't know if she was killed in the aftermath, because this rebellion ultimately failed. But it shook the British, because they didn't expect this to happen in Barbados. Barbados was like, oh, this is the place that we, uh, we treat them pretty well, so why would they rebel in Barbados? Um, but Nanny Grigg, Grigg, excuse me, Nanny Grigg, and we see her name, Nanny, because she was older, she was literate, we know that, that she could read, she could write, so she probably read the news, but she could get the news about the Haitian Revolution, and she knew these things were happening. So she's one of the key organizers in this rebellion. And all these rebellions combined are going to, again, convince the British in 1833 that we got to end slavery because of what happened in Barbados. Um, in Cuba, in the 1840s, and actually even earlier in Cuba, in 1812, you have a guy named Jose Aponte who had planned a rebellion. He was actually a free African who had planned a rebellion in Cuba, um, again, influenced by the Haitian Revolution. And he, alongside a number of influential women and men in his community, uh, plan to end slavery in Cuba. And one of the things that he did, he drew a book. He had a book, because most, again, most of the enslaved Africans weren't literate. So he had a book of pictures that he drew. And he drew pictures of Toussaint Leoverture and Dessaline and, and, and Henry Christophe. And he drew pictures, actually, of George Washington as well, people that he considered revolutionary leaders. I, think, I don't think he knew that George Washington owned slaves, but he saw them as a revolutionary leader of the American independence. So he had this book of pictures that he was going around showing people and saying, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to plan. This is how we're going to lead to independence. Uh, his, a snitch, obviously, or not obviously, but a snitch told on his plans, and his, his rebellion was uh, uh, destroyed before it could start. But not the same with Carlita and Fermina Lacumi. Whenever you see that name Lacumi in Spanish, so this is happening in Cuba, Lacumi means that they came from southwest Nigeria and Yoruba-speaking areas. Uh, Lukumi means my friend or something like that in an old Yoruba language. Uh, and so when they heard Africans say this, they put that as a last name, meaning that they came from Yoruba land. So Lukumi becomes a name designating a place in Africa. So these sisters came from southwest Nigeria, and they led a rebellion in Cuba, which was designed to overthrow enslavement. Again, Cuba had become the largest producer of sugar, taking that title from Haiti. So the, again, the repression kicked up in Cuba, and the importation of more Africans from the continent to meet the demand for, for, for labor also increased after the Haitian Revolution. And Africans resisted more after the Haitian Revolution. Fidel Castro even said, you know, in what way is apartheid different from the practice in effect for centuries? And this is when Nelson Mandela visited Cuba. And when Nelson Mandela came to Cuba, uh, Fidel Castro took him to this monument of resistance that existed in Montazas, Cuba. And he took Mandela there, and he talked about the relationship between Africa and Cuba, uh, between the fight to end slavery and the fight to end depression in the Americas and the fight to end apartheid. And he said, in what way is apartheid different from the practice in effect for centuries of dragging tens of millions of Africans from their land and bringing them to this hemisphere to enslave them, to exploit them? to the last drop of this sweat and blood. Who would know this better than the people of Montazas? Since here, in this part of Western Cuba, there were perhaps more than 100,000 slaves. In the first half of the last century, there were as many as 300,000 slaves in Cuba. And one of the provinces that had the most slaves was this one, which was also the scene of great uprisings. For this reason, there is nothing 
uh, so just or so legitimate as the monument to this rebellious slave uh, who has just been erected in this prophet. So this is a monument to uh, Carlita Lacumi. And this is where Matazas is. So again, a lot of the planters from Haiti actually came to Cuba with their enslaved Africans. They joined uh, the Cuban elite that wanted to increase sugar, uh, sugar production. And these African women, they revolted against this system. And they planned, and they led the revolt, and they used machetes and guns, and they hacked away at the planters. They uh, organized a multi-ethnic coalition in the province. Because again, a lot of these Africans were newly arrived Africans. So you got Fullers, so folks coming from that part of Africa. You got Creoles, you got Gongas. Gongas are folks that are coming out of what's now, I think, Cameroon uh, in the Montazas process. So you got all these, you got, and of course, Lukumi, so folks from Southwest Nigeria, all coming together, all to fight against slavery. So the women organized this. One of the quotes that we get from the uh, trial record, because again, all these rebellions, there's always a trial afterwards to figure out who was involved, what was the scope of this thing, how do we stop it from happening again? And we still have these records that you can read. One of the people testified, testified that they heard uh, Fermina, for, Fermina say, grab the fat white man and hit him with your machete, for he's the one who put shackles on us. So they knew exactly which white folks they was going after. They killed overseers, they killed the mayor, they killed the mayor's assistants, they captured plantations and sugar mills, and they burnt down buildings. And this rebellion happened for a while before it was finally put down by the militias. But this is just one of many uprisings that happened. And you see the role sisters play as organizers, as the actual fighters. There probably was a spiritual element to this as well. And in fact, when the Cubans in the 20th century go into Angola to help uh, the forces that when we talked about in week two or week three, when we talked about uh, 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 the Olinda Rodriguez and her struggle against the Portuguese in, in, in Angola. When the Cubans lent African, uh, Afro-Cuban troops to come into Angola to help with that fighting, they called it Operation Carlotta, named for Carlotta Lacumi. So the Cubans had that historical memory to say, if we're going to go fight in Central Africa, we're going to name it after these African women that fought against enslavement as these Africans are fighting against Portuguese imperialism and also South African apartheid, because the South Africans were present in Angola as well. So you see this historical memory. Um, all right. Um, we're going to stop there today, uh, and we'll pick up more with uh, the fight against enslavement in North America um, as well uh, next week, because we'll talk about the great heroine, Harriet Tubman, because, again, Haitian Revolution has all of these ripple effects, one of them being Napoleon is so hard up after losing Haiti that he needs to get money very quickly, so he sells the Louisiana Territory to Thomas Jefferson which doubles the size of the United States, but also has all this area now open for more uh, cotton cultivation and other things. So more enslavement of Africans and, and, and uh, harsher slavery for African Americans. That leads to more resistance on behalf of, of sisters in what become the United States. And there's no greater example of that than Harriet Tubman, who we'll talk about next week. We'll talk about a few other folks uh, as well. So, We'll stop there today. We'll open it up to any uh, questions or comments uh, about any of these sisters or anything that's uh, going on. Uh, so Daniel, anything in the chat? Uh, no, there's no questions or comments in the chat. Any hands? Questions, comments, concerns? All right, Robert, go ahead. And then we'll go to Gina. Actually, let me go to Gina first, then I'll go to Robert. I've heard Gina. Gina, go ahead. Can you hear me, Yeah. I'm not sure. So I just want to pick up a sense of what got the slavery to the Arab ones before shuttle slavery um, by the Europeans. Is the rate of rebellion similar or equivalent? Is, is, what, is, what, is what similar or equivalent? Like the Rico of rebellion. Yes. At, at first, uh, there's differences, but, and here's why. Here's where they were similar. At the beginnings of that slavery, um, we have a major rebellion that happens in southern Iraq, what's now southern Iraq. 
the Basra Rebellion in 869, 869. When that rebellion happens, it, it happens when a bunch of Africans are imported into southern Iraq to do essentially uh, labor involving taking, taking, removing salt from an area for agricultural production. So they were trying to do a plantation style. Slave.